Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Fly Culture Podcast. I don't know if you're like me, that I had some fishing planned this week with some good friends. Um, the weather's played a part in that, so we were washed off. Um, and like I've said before on these sorts of things, the part of the grayling fishing, the pace of it's a little bit different. I was due to be going with my friends, Warren and Jim, and part of that is sort of sitting around and chewing the fat and talking about stuff in general. Um, my friend Warren, who's he's been reconditioning, if that's the right term, old pipes. And it seems as though it's fascinating that these things are as close to sort of bamboo rods and there's a, a very there's particular models that are fantastic and he's been refurbishing those and I sit down with him and smoke a cigar Jim's a reformed smoker and he sort of kind of looks at us and he doesn't say anything but sort of watches while we we, we sort of puff away and enjoy those but that that's really really good fun and a, a great part of it as well but I'm hoping everyone's well and obviously conditions have taken a turn for the worse in the world and, and the UK and I hope you're hanging in there okay and I hope these um, podcasts help in some small way as well and and get you to the river if you're unable to get there right now but today my guest is Alex Jardine um, he's grown up in and around fishing um, from an early age, he's represented England at junior level at fly fishing. He's worked in tackle shops. Um, he has worked at fisheries. He's been a guide. Um, and now he works with fly fishing holiday specialist Arvart McLeod. He has an intimate knowledge of the industry and of fishing too. And I'm hoping it's that sort of time of year that we've done sort of plenty on alternative species i guess with carp and and mullet and um pike that you know this time of year we're thinking a little bit more about grayling as well so my hope is to get some tips and hints from him that i hope you all find interesting and of use as well so i'm going to be um hoping to get lots of information from him but alex it's great to have you on the fly culture podcast how are you doing thanks very much pete it's lovely to uh, lovely to join you and it's been been a strange old year we haven't been able to to catch up on the river even though we've we've talked about it a couple of times um and that's rather summed up the year it's been strange but still doing a fair bit of fishing and um, looking forward to the the winter grazing great it's been funny hasn't it that i know like you say we've been chatting we've either had not enough water or too much water and there hasn't been an in in between but while i was preparing for the show i was remembering a day's fishing i you probably won't remember but i think it was in april quite a few years back now and it was abs i think it was easter as well and it was absolutely freezing <laughs> And we stuck at it, and and I, I was so proud to show you some of my favourite little streams. And we fished the upper tour and got our backsides kicked. Yes. And then we fished the bray, and we walked all the way up the bray, and then we hit a magical. Pool. I remember moments where I couldn't feel my fingers or anything. And then we hit a, a pool at exactly the right time, and fish were rising everywhere. And it it was just worth all of that hardship just for that half hour wasn't it it was yeah it's amazing how those um you can beat yourself up for a whole day just for that half hour of uh, of magical fishing and it makes it all seemingly worthwhile it was and it was really interesting wasn't it that in devon as you well know the fishing down here we don't tend to get constant rises all the time but i kind of remember that olive hatch and they were just going weren't they and the fish were just rising and it was just meant to be and it was almost felt i know it wasn't the case but it almost felt that it was a reward for our endeavors well that's how i like to spin it anyway. yeah i think that's the best way to look at it absolutely and there was yeah. some good fish about too yes there were yeah. some nice ones weren't there yeah it was it it, it was uh, one of those special days yeah. i have to say so um my hope is to get you back down on the tour and and um have a go at those salmon as well because yeah. that would be great not that i'm any sort of expert as, as everyone knows i've got a proper kicking this year but <laughs> fingers crossed for next year and that's that just keeps me going enough and i'm already looking forward to it now i think brilliant as long as i don't tell my dad i'm chasing salmon i'll, I'll be all right <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to talk a little bit about your um fishing background and first off i wanted to congratulate you on the birth of your son the jardine fishing dynasty continues it does hopefully um 
he already has shown a little bit of interest whenever a passing YouTube video has come up or uh, especially when the, the fly culture magazines drop in and always point out the pictures to him. Um, it has been a bit of a life changer. It puts everything into a bit of perspective and um, turn what could be a fairly horrendous year into quite a special year. And um, um, my wonderful partner does not restricted my fishery at all so I've managed to balance both quite nicely this year that's good to hear and it's I guess if we look at yourself as well with a surname like Jardine it was inevitable you would end up as a fly angler as well can you remember sort of you probably can't because I guess you were probably so young the first time you sort of had a fly rod in your hand and was was casting um to be honest and it's a I would say a bit tragic, but I I can't remember. It, it's been almost as if I was born into it, and um, and it's been a wonderful journey right from the beginning. I've got pictures of me being held up by my belt because I can barely stand or barely hold myself up on the banks of Diva Springs, being pulled about by some big seven or eight pound rainbow that's going mental. Um, and it really continues from there. And I have, I've been so fortunate to, to fish so often, uh, even from the age of four, five, six years old, that uh, it, like you all know, they all begin to merge into one and it's one big good memory rather than individual lots of happy memories. Yeah, that's nice. Nicely put. Uh, You know, often when I ask these and when I'm talking to people, I ask them about mentors, but we can clearly skip that part of it. But what's really interesting to me, and I'm going to use a footballing analogy here that I kind of remember um, the footballer Johan Cruyff and his son, Jordi Cruyff, who went to play over at Man U. And it seemed as though being in his father's following in his father's footsteps was a little bit more difficult for him for yourself though you are so super relaxed you do your own thing you're never bothered by that sort of stuff I, I just think that's really cool that you 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 don't feel any sort of pressure when you're out fishing because of your um, background I guess no I mean I'm fortunate in a in a way that um, my father and I are, are quite have quite different personalities he he's obviously an artist well known for that um the way he does things is in a very creative way um but i'm much more mathematical minded and everything has to be um formulaic it has to be in an order and i think just by having that slightly different approach to things means that we we've able to forge a road which is incredibly similar on the outside but actually the nuts and bolts behind it are are very different and um, rather than try and push back against it uh, my father is who he is and uh, it's wonderful to have him there and uh, the people that he's friends with are our mentors you mentioned them they're, they're people's idols and I've been lucky enough to to walk with them and and learn from them and um yeah utilize that and and make it your own and and make the most of a of a great situation it was interesting the first time i became aware of that i was fishing with you and we were fishing for grayling and it it struck me that i probably needed to to fish a euro style setup but you just weren't bothered. You set up a duo and thought, right, I'll have some fun with that. And I, I that to me spoke volumes about your own path. And I thought that was so cool because I think if, you know, I had a, a father in that, I'd be worrying. The, and I've, I've spoken about it on podcasts before of just being a guide, really, and the pressure I felt that you're supposed to really sort of catch all the fish. And if you and you're supposed to because that's what you do and if you don't then you're not any good and it it became quite a pressure from that point of view but that's where it was really interesting for me that I saw and it it helped me a lot actually seeing that so thank you for that and it was just really refreshing to see that and it wasn't a motivation right I've got to go out there and and catch the fish it was part of a bigger 
a picture, but you weren't bothered it by it in the slightest. So yeah, thank you. I, I thought that was really really cool. Well, thank you for saying. I mean, it, uh, when it's all said and done, uh, obviously a lot of the people who will be reading your magazine, uh, listening to the podcast, they uh, they fly fish for the enjoyment of it, and the only the only person or the only thing you've got to prove yourself to is, is the fish at the end of it and um if you're happy catching one fish a day and um, that's not for someone else to judge that's how you like to fish and if yeah. if you don't catch anything that's not necessarily your fault um you could have gone out on the river this week and it would be flooded uh, not had a chance to catch anything, but still had one of the best days fishing you could have had just by the enjoyment of being out. Um, yeah. So I think it, it's just a case of getting the right attitude to to suit your personality. There's nothing wrong with catching a lot or catching a little, as long as you enjoy your time out there. Yeah. And do you sense a change in people's it may be driven by lockdown it may be it may not be or or what we're going through at the moment do you sense there is a a shift in that a little bit that people are looking to experience the bigger picture of it all rather than just the end product of it are you are you getting a sense of that um you get a mix and i think it, um i suppose my own my own guiding um, I'm sort of in that London catchment where people come from typically because quite broad sweeping and not definitely all encompassing. Uh, you get people from a competitive business background who everything's about catching lots, the biggest and performance related. Um, and that hasn't really changed too much this year. You still get the people who just want to catch the biggest. Um, so there's not that appreciation that others have. Um, but definitely, um, each individual is different and they're looking for something different. Um, I'm, as much as it annoys everyone that I fish with, I'm super keen on pointing out any bird life or butterfly that passes by. And um, some people will just go and fish by themselves so they don't have to listen to me pointing out the next kingfisher or brimstone butterfly early in the year or so forth but um i think that stems a lot from my early days of competition fishing and that i've done that high intensity fishing and i've, I've moved on from that stage and I, I don't particularly want to go back to it mm. it's interesting i was talking to somebody else who's deeply entrenched within fishing um just the other day actually and it was interesting we were saying that fishing what it means to us and i obviously include yourself in that um is so much and do you think that is because that broader area that you're interested in is because a you're fortunate enough as you said to be out on the river a lot and so everything that goes as part of that whereas if somebody's got you know as i joke about a proper job that their moments on the water are a lot short uh shorter that they're slightly more focused on other aspect or the the main aspect of it do you think there's a little bit of that as well that 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 we're so deeply entrenched in there is definitely um if you can only uh, i try and fish once a week which there'll be people listening, shouting, saying that oh, I wish I fished that much. And when you do it, you think, oh, if only I could get another day in here or there. Uh, but quite often my day is probably like yourself. Um, there'll be two or three hours on an evening or an afternoon uh, in between other jobs around the house. And uh, But it's just that quick fit. And uh, I think if you, if you do have a normal job i mean we're lucky to not have normal jobs um yeah. you set aside your fishing day you put it in the diary it's in there and you make your coffee at five o'clock in the morning so you can hit the river at first light and um and you don't want to leave till last night and i i can see the the benefits of both and if i travel down to devon or i go up to wales that's how i plan my day as, oh, it will be a full day on the water, but 
on my local clubs, it will just be a case of, oh, I'll just nip out for a couple of hours here and there and see what happens. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. And that fix, like you say, it, it sort of keeps you going for a little bit, doesn't it? it? Does, and then yeah. until you need need another hit, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, depending on how good or how bad the fishing's been, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, then you come back for more. And funnily enough, my friend Perry and I made a road trip up onto the chalk streams not so long ago. And we were fishing until it was dark. Yes. And I remember when I did have a proper job that, that's what you did. And I remember being out on the river at 10 o'clock at night, having to make a long, great big journey back yeah. home again. But you did it because you wanted to do it. And that uh, uh, was the day of fishing, as it were. So I think perhaps we've unc- I'm, I'm sort of trying to understand my psyche a little yeah. bit. And yeah. it's interesting speaking to people with a similar sort of um, background as well, how it affects them and, uh, and in different ways as well. So really, really interesting. But um, is it rivers that mainly where your passion lies? Um, it all it, it is. Um, certainly, um, as a youngster, it was late. So they were much more accessible. Um, it, you didn't require sort of permanent supervision on on a lake. Um, whereas on a river, there's far more hazards. So it, it's better to be with someone when you're younger. Um, but uh, from about the age, of, I've always fished rivers, but from about the age of 11 or 12, um, that passion started to really push through. Um, just about the time when waders would last almost a season before you outgrew them. Um, and um, from there, I've never really looked back. So now I can count on one hand the amount of days I spend on a lake, whereas originally it would have been vice versa. And what do you think it is for you? Because I'm, as you well know, exactly the same, and I can't put my finger on what it is. Um, but what do you think means that you don't fish lakes as often as you used to? Do you, do you know what it is? Um, a bit like you, you can, you can guess at the reasons. And, and when I do fish a lake, I thoroughly enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've uh, had had a trip down to Wimbledon this year which was fantastic uh, in the boat and I like the drifting in a boat element but uh, I suppose it's the wild constant changing of a river that um, that you can go to the same place every day of the year and it will be different um, mm. whereas on a lake uh, that can be true too but I personally I feel uh, the river offers me more Hmm. yeah yeah i i I think that's probably what it is and as you say every day is completely different and you think you've got a day where you everything's gone to plan go back the next day and it's completely different and i think that's one of the big attractions isn't it that you're never quite on top of things and things are continually changing the and of course at the start of the season down here as well i guess that the the rivers may be affected by big surges of water and can be different and that little honey hole you thought was there is slightly different so you've got to relearn it and I think it's that aspect of it certainly for me but um, it's interesting you mentioned Wimbledon because it's getting a lot of publicity rightly so yes um, for the way that it's being managed right now by um, I think it's Mark Underwood yes Um, Yeah. yeah which they're doing great great job and it's lovely to see somewhere doing so really really well and just getting phenomenally great write-ups but what we're going to do with this is is move away from the lakes and what I was really keen to do was pick your brains about um, the grayling season as a whole and then perhaps get an idea of how you're setting up to fish the river on a winter's day and um, you know I, I guess we want to start with saying there was a time where we would fish you know i remember some place i think on the wiley i used to just fish a dry fly dry fly through the winter uh just for fun and perhaps sometimes hang a bead off the back and and go from there but more so now i think when we think about grayling fishing it's probably more urinymphing isn't it where that we're we're approaching and it's a, a newish relative um approach to fishing and um is a very very 
a good one to have in the armory as well. And um, what I wanted to do was get a sense of the setups and the flies and how you might approach the water in that sense. But it doesn't mean you you forsake everything for your nymphing. Do you, as when we fish, still like to fish the duo or just a normal indicator? Do you like to mix it? Yeah. Um, I mean, I still love um, fishing the duo. Uh, like that day we had on the winter, um, it's just a, a no fuss setup. Uh, you know exactly where you stand. Um, you need to keep control, but your control can be a little bit more relaxed than your own thing. Um, and uh, like you said, you you just can't beat a dry fly, even even in the winter. Um, the reason it's not as popular as your spell of dry fly activity might only be. 30 minutes or an hour long in a, on a winter's day and um whilst we whilst we can get more relaxed and not and it doesn't matter about catching we still do need to catch from time to time just to keep everything ticking over uh, and that's where more nymphing focus setups take over um, and uh, my preferred method, uh, particularly on the short streams, is to sight nymph, um, whether a euro setup or or not, but just use a single nymph and and watch the fish's reaction. Um, that's that's probably what marginally one below a dry fly because you're watching everything, everything's unfurling in front of you, and it's um, incredibly exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm with you on that. And again, on that day, that's what I was doing. And I really enjoyed it. And I stuck just a normal indicator on and um, it was just really, really good fun. And I, I talk about it sometimes on here and the the casting aspect of it is something I've always really, really enjoyed. And it's just nice to do it. It's yes. fun. I, I like all of them. They're all good. Um, but sometimes you just feel oh, I, I fancy doing this or I fancy doing that. Let's just quickly come on to the duo very quickly before we go on to um nymphing how do you set up your duo is it a short dropper on the dry or do you just hang it off the back or you vary between um so uh, i've always generally hung it off the back of the hook um so tied um traditional new zealand style um particularly for um it doesn't matter so much for small grayling small grayling like small trout are incredibly aggressive when they hit a fly everybody knows about it but for a bigger fish um they've perfected the art of feeding and their movements are incredibly subtle it will be a fraction to the left fraction to the right and some if you had your dry fly hanging on a dropper you you just wouldn't even know the fish had taken your fly and it's not until you fish crystal clear water that you even know that that's happening and um you can point it out to people and they'll cast uh they'll have 10 fish take the fly and the indicator won't move at all and if you then work that out onto a river in devon or a river in wales where you can't see the fish um if you're catching one in every 10 fish that are taking your fly that's not a great ratio so um uh that um i prefer the tying off the bend because it is a little bit more uh responsive yeah 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 and it always feels as though if i'm tying it off the bend of the hook i'm actually more so not always but more so fishing the nymph rather than the the dry if that makes sense as well yeah. and if i think with the chance i'll go to the others but it's fascinating i think i mentioned on here before that exactly the same i stood on a chalk stream on a bridge while a friend was fishing New Zealand I think it was duo on New Zealand I can't yeah. remember now and you could I could see the fish taking the fly and nothing happens and that's where it segues beautifully into urine thing because the subtlety of a take is really amplified isn't it and yeah. it's pretty difficult not to see those takes isn't it it is yeah um definitely um fly selection uh, which I know we'll move on to is is key but um just by using a sight a bit of line um it just makes everything that much more responsive um the chance of missing tapes um is reduced you, there, 
inevitably will be times and they still don't register. Um, but it, it does help. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell me about, let's start at the very bottom then and let's talk about the flies. And first off, are you a, a two or three or is that condition dependent and and um, where you're actually fishing as well? Uh, it's completely completely dependent on uh, on the water um, conditions. Um, so short stream, generally, I'm a one fly person um, just because I uh, the pace is quite uniform and the depth is quite uniform. So you can select a fly that will get you to the depth that you want. And generally, even in the winter, uh, the stretches that I pick to fish will be clear. So the only thing that's working against you is the angle of the sun. Um, so you get a lot of um, a lot of glare on the water. But I will always try and spot the fish rather than follow the indicator if I can. But some days that's not possible, or some areas of the river that's not possible. Uh, so there I'll go with one, whereas on the f uh, on the froom and, and waters that are more susceptible to rain and are carrying a bit of colour, uh, I will, uh, I'll go two flies for some, but usually three flies, but one of those flies is, is what I would call a controlling fly, uh, which I think we're going to talk about uh, makeup in a second. Um, yeah. And... Um, and that's all part of that. And um, we'll talk. About, we'll, I'll ask you about that controlling fly in a second. But when you're, let's say you're fishing those, uh, let's say our listeners, the majority of them are fishing waters that do not have crystal clarity. Um, so you're going for that three fly setup in that. So you've got your controlling fly in there. The other two or the three. Will you think about that setup as well? So might you have something with, let's say, an orange tag in it and then a more drab fly and then something else? And I know you you fish, you have a great shrimp pattern as well. Yeah. Do you how, how do you approach that? And if you could explain a little bit about the controlling fly as well, please. So generally I'll look to have uh, two fishing flies, so flies in the areas where they should be catching fish. Um, and that changes. So before Christmas, so October, November, December, uh, that will be a heaviest fly on the point, um, which is usually either a red tag, an orange tag, uh, and then a lighter shrimp fly uh, on the dropper, um, uh, usually about 50 centimeters above uh, the point fly. Um, and that will be usually uh, the pink and purple shrimp, which uh, you know quite well. Um, but again, you might have a red tag or a little hairs here, so um, different water will, will change that. Uh, whereas after Christmas, then I'm looking to have two flies fishing the same depth, essentially. So that will be two heavy flies, one on the point, one on the dropper. Uh, if you're a competitive angler, then you're uh, restrained in how close they can be, so they'll be 50 centimetres apart. Um, but if you're fishing for enjoyment, then you, you can make those closer together. You can make them 20 or 30 centimeters apart. Uh, and if it's colored water, then you might go quite heavy on the colors. So big red tags, big orange tags. Uh, I'll usually always fish a red and an orange tag together, uh, even in clear water. Uh, once you get into January, February and the fish are moving down into the deeper water and it's interesting isn't it you mentioned those tag flies as well because even they'll work in trout season as well won't they, they the do. trout don't seem to happen too much yes no and i mean obviously the red tag pits up quite often on the trout it's a well-known trout fly um mm. but um generally pink tags and, and orange tags can be a bit more selective on the grayling if you put them near them um, but I find shrimp fly, coloured shrimp flies to be the most selective if you want to pick grayling up uh, during the Perfect. trout season. Perfect. And th there has been a little bit of a trend to go for smaller, 
heavier flies. Do you subscribe to that sort of 16? And we've had these um, wide gape jig hooks in size 16 that you can get a bigger bead on. Um, do you subscribe to that as well? Um, it, yes and no. Um, I, I generally, I'm quite traditional in my bead sizes on the flies. I don't always go for this oversized bead. Um, but uh, my trout nymph box will range from more or less 14, 16 to 20, whereas my grayling box will go from 10 to 16 with the odd 18. So actually the, the size of grayling fly I'm using is much bigger than uh, the equivalent trout nymphs. Interesting. Um, and, and that's only a, re, uh, a relatively recent move to go to much bigger flies for grayling, but it, it definitely seems to, um, seems to attract them. That's a great tip. And bead colours. Uh, do you have any thoughts on bead colours? You like a, a mixture, I guess. I do. I have a, a vast range. Um, silver increasingly became popular uh, in my box over the last well, five, five or six seasons. Um, then uh, oranges. Uh, Coppers still do quite well, but I always say it's a bit of a trout colour. Um, and uh, gold beads, which spent a long time not going in my box have come full circle again and i've got a lot more flies using gold beads and um and i know a lot of people now don't tie with them because they sort of work on the basis that all fish have seen them but if no one's tying on gold beads then no fish is seeing them yeah yeah absolutely i think that's very fair i'm I'm like that i'll if i think that we'll go the other way and uh funnily enough black Black beads, are they something you use as well? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, I'm trying to wrap my brain now for any black beaded flies. I, they tend to make a lot of my trout bots, um, whereas uh, a lot of my grayling flies, um, beaded flies uh, tend to be the glitzy ones, tend to be the colourful ones. Uh, and then if I want something drab, they'll tend to be the shrimp pattern, so with the lead underbodies. So I'm not looking for a dull bead. I've, making up for it by not having a bead at all hmm. yeah so let's go we've got an idea of flies and and how your setup's going to be you're fishing somewhere for the first time that you've sort of had a look at a little bit and you're you're, you're figuring it out but generally if you you're fishing somewhere that you don't know so well you've got a uranymph set up on um how far from your point fly to the indicator do you tend to set do you have something in your mind that you'll say yeah i think this is for most situations most conditions i can make this work sure um it, it obviously clarity of the water will vary a lot um but generally first time on a water um i'll start from the indicator and work down uh, so usually it'll be about um we didn't talk about the sacrificial fly before it'll usually be about 12 inches to a sacrificial fly uh, from the indicator uh, and that will be quite a heavy fly that will be a three or three and a half mil bead uh, and that gives you control on a windy day as well it will help anchor the indicator in place uh, then from uh, that um, 12 inches it will be about another three feet to the next fly um, and then another two feet to the fly behind that so you're well, are you six feet generally would be a standard setup uh, if you get to deep water you can let the indicator go underneath the water and have half of it showing that will give you a bit of extra depth uh, if it's shallow or water you could obviously raise the indicator up and fish it that way so you can vary the depth without having to change change yeah. the tip at then fantastic excellent let's go up some further then go up a little bit further um what about um indicator do you just use the bicolor mono or is there anything that you use and if so how long do you tend to have your indicator sure um i mean i do use the bicolor um it's the easiest thing to get hold of um i do um some people have it uh, the airflow um running line um it was a braided running line with a um a core uh, that was on a um uh, had a hollow core monofilament which was perfect for indicator making and unfortunately mm. they stopped making it or it's not available anymore uh, but i still have 
enough stash to probably see me out of my life fun. Um, but um, keeping it accessible, the bicolour does work. Um, I find even with my relatively good young eyes still, I'm holding on to that fact, um, <laughs> I can struggle to see it at times. Uh, so usually I'll double it up rather than, so it'll be two strands together rather than a single strand. Uh, and that does make it more visible. Um, uh, it just helps, particularly on a cold winter's day when you're struggling to concentrate because it's minus temperatures. That's a really good tip, thinking about doubling up. I've, if I'm struggling, what I do is when I use a bicolour and tie it on, or I've been using a whole leader setup, is use some black permanent marker as well in there. Yes. And so just within those bicolours as well, so just short little sections, and that's helped me, but I like the idea of, of doubling up as well. Yeah. That's a great idea. Uh, and the, the other secret one I've got is the um, – it's from pole fishing. And it's called bristle um bristle paint and it comes in like a tippet pot and uh it comes in black yellow and red i think and um you just literally brush it on so if you want to change quickly you're struggling to see it you can just brush a little bit of paint on and it suddenly um sort of springs out against the dark background nice yeah. good tip good tip i think there's somebody brought something out as well didn't they where it was almost it looked like a big lipstick almost okay, yes. in some colours. Yeah, I can't remember what that one's called, but I saw it very briefly. I've not seen it for a little bit. But, yeah, those things do, like you say, and you know what it's like when it's freezing cold and your your sort of mind's slightly yeah. elsewhere as well, but you you might miss that one moment. Uh, so, yes. yeah, those, those things are really important, aren't they? But they are. They are. And, um, I mean, we both fish uh, the frame where, as you know, you might only get, three or four tapes in a day so that's three or four all come in the time when you're not paying attention that's your that's your day done yeah yeah no absolutely um let's move up the line a little bit further then and the leader because i sort of am using as i said an all all in one job that has an indicator and and a leader in a, a milky colored one but for many years i just cut back a normal ta or an old tapered leader that had almost I'd cut too far up it because for me that part of it all I really want is something that's able to turn over the payload um where, where are you on this what, what are you using and how do you do that um so a bit of a mix um if I want a day where I might have to change tactics um I will I will do what you did I'll take a, a nine foot leader uh, and essentially take off the tippet section until you're almost back at the taper um so nine foot leader would become about six or seven feet long and attach that straight to the indicator um and then run it off a a euro nymph line so a low diameter fly line um and that that works nicely um the problem is the connection between the leader and the fly line can get caught in the rug ring um but if the fish suddenly start rising, all I have to do is cut off the the nymph's entire dry fly on, and it will it will present uh, at a short to medium range. Uh, whereas if I'm fairly sure I'm not going to see any rising fish all day, uh, then I will go for a much longer leader. I, I'll use a uh, I'll actually use a carp shock leader, um, which is thirty foot long, um, and it's tapered all the way along. Um, down to 12, a 12 pound tip and then tie my indicator off there and fish the, uh, the indicator to hand. Um, and then there's no fly line element. Uh, and that helps you fish at a longer range when you're, when you're fishing them. Yeah, that's really, really interesting um, and very, very useful tip as well. And it's it's worth mentioning, isn't it? Because I have a Euro line on there, but a lot of that comes from the competition scene and having to have that. Uh, yet for years I used, I think it was Hen's leader that was, like you say, 30 foot long yeah. and did the job fantastic. I'm not fishing competition, so it doesn't matter. I can do whatever I like. Um, but I felt I wanted to do that because sometimes people say, well, you're not using a fly line and stuff like that when I was guiding with it and stuff like that. So that was the reason I did it. But that doesn't stop you. If you're not fishing competitions, 
going down that route, is it? You can that's just go and... No. Um, I mean, the flip side is um, to get the distance, you need to cast either way, whether you've got the Euro line or, or leader to hand. Uh, if you want to fish it at range, um, you need to have a casting style. So it's not just a case of throwing the nymphs up and letting them come back. Uh, you can do that, and it does work. Um, but to get better results, it helps to be able to cast with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've got our terminal tackle, I guess, yeah. um, pretty much organised. Um, rods, let's come on to rods. Um, what sort of rods are you using? What sort of length? And I, I guess you're favouring those softer tip um dedicated rods are you yes yeah so um i moved um very early over to 10 feet rods and it was um it actually had nothing to do with nymph fishing it was all to do with dry fly fishing i moved over to 10 feet rods because of um fishing in portugal where you were fishing dry flies in pocket water but to super spooky fish that you couldn't get near and if you had a seven and a half foot rod which would have been ideal for that same water here um it would have meant that you'd have to get too close to the fish that they would have been gone by the time you got there uh, but with a 10 foot rod you could just flip the fly forward and hold it in position by keeping the rod tip raised and having no line on the water um and then as as I moved on to different waters, I adapted, I say I adapted, lots of people did, but I brought that into my uh, duo fishing, my New Zealand style, where you were using a, a longer rod and um, controlling the fly by having no line on the water. Um, and that was just the same as you would be doing if you were check nymphing at the time, because there was no French leader, there was no Euro nymph then. It was, you fished a, seven eight nine foot leader in total length with a long rod um but the move over to longer leaders allowed you to fish um as i was doing with the dry flies in portugal or or duo fishing um but with a check nymph style set up on the end so you're able to fish really deep for really long drifts so you were covering larger sides of water um so definitely a move to to longer rods um but weight is key um because you're trying to load a rod and there's no point having a 10 foot seven weight because you won't be able to get the flies forward um so on the market there were only really four and three weights in a 10 foot length at the time and now they go all the way down to ones and all sorts so but my standard Graylin rod is a nine and a half foot uh, two weight uh, rod that's produced by Guideline, um, which is uh, called an LPS, which as you know, I was uh, very lucky to be involved in the, in the design work of. That must have been really interesting. We'll come on to that. And it's interesting you mentioned nine and a half foot rod as well, um, because I'm fishing a nine and a half foot rod a lot of the time now, and it just feels I've just uh, got a 10 foot turn up now, which I want to use more as an out and out nymphing rod. But the nine and a half is sort of between between the two. But it feels to me as a river angler who gr grew up fishing shorter rods, it feels, and not fish 10 foot seven weights on reservoirs, yeah. it feels more familiar to me. And I, I strung up the 10 footer the other day, and it was lovely, it cast beautifully but it does feel different to cast comparable. I feel more comfortable with a nine and a half foot rod. It's really, really funny. I don't know why my nymphing rods are all 10 footers, but you know, I'm trying to explore this um, one rod does everything. Is there a rod that will allow me to cast a fly line conventionally yet also fish nymphs? And I don't know in your, your design process, of the rod if that was something you considered or you went just straight down we need to think and come up with a uh, nymphing rod that will do all that do that job as a nymphing rod and and no more is that is that how you looked at it or? um essentially we uh we all came together there were a whole host of us um 
uh, which involved um, a couple of us who were dedicated nymph fishers who had a background in it. Um, but then a mixture of anglers from Europe who um, didn't have that nymphing background. They had a dry fly and a, a more traditional style of fishing background. And we, from a very early stage, we wanted a rod that anyone could use. So um, the dedicated nymphing rods, they, they tend to be so tactic specific that actually they become difficult to use if you've never done the tactic before. And when we took people that were used to casting all the time and gave them styles of rod that were purely nymphing style, they couldn't actually do the method effectively because they couldn't get on with the rod. And uh, as soon as we tweaked the blank a little bit to make it a more traditional dry fly style blank with a soft tip, uh, they were then able to fish nymphs better because they understood the rod a lot more. Um, so in the end, we pretty much designed the perfect dry fly rod that happens to also be the perfect nymphing rod just by changing your leader setup and, and fly choice. That's really interesting because the term I used the other day was a Swiss Army knife rod, yeah. if that makes sense, that would, would do everything. And, yeah, it's kind of nice to to think of something that you can just make those switches. I'm not one. I'm far too clumsy to carry two rods. I'll either forget it, tread on it, or if it's stuffed somewhere, I'm probably going to break it on the tip of a yeah. tree or something. So that's part of my process with that to to go down that route. But the design thing fascinates me greatly. And was that, uh, it's obviously a collaborative process, but what, is it a long process or is there a need to try and bring that rod to the marketplace um, quickly, yet making sure that you've got the rod that you want to bring at that time rather than rushing and you know is it, how, how does that process work um it, it is a lengthy process and and whilst the processor on that particular rod was sped up it was still 12 months 18 months in in the making because you have to um as you all know but not many people know you you start out with an idea um and then you have to pull the pieces together. You've got to find the blank that works. And uh, the difficulty, there's always one person at the top, the rod designer, uh, who will send you uh, so a four-piece rod and you'll have 10, 10 sections arrive and you mix them up until you find the four that work best for you. Uh, but you might have eight people all doing the same process. And... <laughs> the rod designer comes back and he still requires all 10 sections to make the rod to suit all the people he's talking to. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error going on and um, you've, you've got to have a starting base, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a process that it's worth spending the time on just to get the, the details right and details that you wouldn't, think take very long of the ones that take the longest so whether we have a keeper ring or how many rings do we have or the shape of the handle the color of the blank how it's finished that type of thing and it and it um when all said and done it actually changes how the rod fishes you might not think that the varnish on the rod makes any difference but it will completely change the end product mm. And there must be a, a huge element of pride when that comes to the marketplace and, you know, you've been a part of that process. It must have been thrilling to see those rods come to the market and, and see people enjoy them, I guess. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. To know that you had a, had a helping hand in, in putting a rod that honestly is, is more than, more than fit for the task. And, um, have we, when we were designing it, one of our key things was to make a rod that was re the best it could be for the price that we wanted. And we wanted a price that made it accessible to people looking to try the method for the first time. Um, and in the end, we had a rod that covered 
all experience levels and as a price that was incredibly competitive cool that's exciting cool let's move on to the casting thing because we've talked about that a little bit and i generally over the winter and certainly the last couple of winters i've been fishing this funky little stream for grayling that um i'm not going to name but i've had great days down there with with friends as a, a guest and i find that i can turn over nymphs just by rotating my wrist really really easily and one of the things that you mentioned earlier um before we move on to sort of river craft and stuff was casting at distance do you have any sort of um tips for that 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 people could employ if they want to um land their flies a little bit further away yeah absolutely and um for anyone that's um ever spent too many hours in the evening reading up on casting books um yeah. we'll we'll read about casts such as the belgium cast or the oval cast um which requires um I'm going to try and do it, bringing, bringing the rod plane out to the side and then back over the top. So when you're making the back cast, the flies essentially are going underneath the rod tip. And when you make the forward cast, they go over the top. So when casting three nymphs, you're not looking to get a tight loop to break through the wind. You've got, quite possibly on some days, you've got three tungsten beads on the end. There's no wind that's going to blow those back towards you. Um, the critical bit is getting the timing right. It's not just a case of lobbing them forwards. And um, it took a bit of getting used to, but one of the things that helps is actually um, fishing relatively clear water. Uh, I don't always fish the flies level to me and down below me because the fish simply aren't there anymore. Uh, so quite often I'll try and pick the flies up while they're still upstream of me. Uh, and that means that you're already in that casting motion of bringing the flies back, loading the rods, and then placing them forward. And because they're beads, you've got a fraction of a second where everything's timed perfectly and the flies will go where you want them. And either side of that, the cast will go anyone's guess. It will go in the reeds on the left, in the tree on the right. Um, and um, the best way to practice it is if you've got a garden or a piece of water it's actually just to get one heavy fly on a leader and just practice casting it and landing it in the same place over and over again and it, it's a really good um sort of practice drill uh, to get you in the hand of being incredibly accurate and and you should you should be able to cast 35 40 feet with with these setups it's not just a under the rod tip under your feet type of fishing cool cool great tip great tip um so let's imagine we're on river x you've not fished there before um i guess for a lot of the time you're looking to make your flies drift as naturally through the water column as you possibly can but are there times where you want to slow them down or even speed them up uh, definitely um i'll always uh, the river will always be fastest at the surface. So um, generally your indicator will be slightly slower than surface debris, but that will mean that your flies are still going slightly faster than the current below them. And that's how you want them. And if you're holding the indicator above the water, um, so it's pointing down, it should always be slightly slanted away from you. So it shouldn't be slanting back towards you because then you're not in control of your flies. So you always want to try and look to have the indicator slightly slanting away from you. Um, and the only time that that changes a little bit is when you get to back eddies or areas of dead water where the grayling love to grab around in particularly um, a little bit now, but slightly more um, into next month when all of the leaves are stuck on the bottom of the river and they're starting to decay. There's lots of food around them. But the grayling will hone in on these areas. And if you can just twitch the fly through them, it just helps rather than just having a static, non moving fly just hanging in the water. Just by twitching, using really your thumb and forefinger just to move them backwards and forwards. 
that will get the flies to jig up and down as they go through and it looks really lifelike and um and the grayling can't help themselves and uh, yeah. i actually caught a fairly sizable perch doing the same thing last year on the river river owl wow Wow. Yeah. That's the a really interesting point is that the manipulation of the flies is another added dimension to this form of fishing, isn't it? That you can jig them in little way in, in a, a little way just to induce them in that way. Yeah. And that brings me nicely on to at the end of the drift. And, you know, I know a few minutes ago that you said that you will um not fish you feel that the fish have gone because you're sort of standing there sure. my method is to slowly lift yes um and i know traditionally they've said right hit it at the end of the the drift or strike at the end of the drift but i've found i feel i can get better bang for my buck by slowly lifting the flies if there's someone there it it, it just makes it an easier hit but where, where do you stand on that what, what do you tend to do um it definitely i think there is an argument to strike at the end. I think it's almost more important if you're fishing downstream from you, um, because quite often once it's down, the flies will be lifting through the water and the fish will lift with them and take, and that strike will just maybe get anything that, that could be going past. Um, but in front of you, by lifting um, you almost, slowly, you're almost inducing a fish that's followed it to, um, to have a go if it's undecided at that point. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it, the interesting thing about the slower lift is that, yes, it does on occasion catch me some fish, but sometimes I will bump them as well. And that, that brings home that setting thing rather than you know, sometimes I think I'm trying to play it through in my mind while you're talking about it. And I think I slowly lift and then sort of go, yeah. but you know, it, it's interesting and interesting way to actually approach it. But when do you think about making changes? Do you look at a pool and step into a pool, for example, and think, right, this looks a bit deeper. I need to change. Or will you adjust where you're fishing the rod level as it were, or do you immediately or quickly make changes and assess the situation? Um, each day is different, um, which buys me a bit of a get out of jail answer. But um, uh, when I know the river, I, I, I feel that I've got a good, um, good selection of flies. So I know that they should be the right flies and fish in the right way. Um, and, uh, some days if I know it's a river that has a lot of grayling, uh, and I fish, I might only fish 10 yards. And if I've not had a take, the flies are being changed and I'm changing something. Uh, yeah, another river where I know that change, uh, takes a few and far between, I might wait until I've fished, um, sort of three or four pools. And if nothing's happened, then then it's time to start thinking about what I'm doing, whether that's changing where the flies are or the color. Usually it's the color, the type of fly first, uh, then another couple of pools. Then, then we're starting to look into actual leader maker. Um, the nice thing, and I have a feeling in the winter that um, grayling like particular spots. And for me, that that's always medium depth, medium flow, because that's, that's the areas that give you nice clean gravel. Usually you've got an offshoot of current where you've got the dead spot where you need to jig your flies. But if you're, if you're fishing water that's about thigh to waist deep um, and the flow's fairly steady but not too strong, there should be grayling there. Um, so you're not having to change your leader in from an eight foot pool to a three foot pool to then a six foot pool. Uh, you should always be looking for those similar areas uh, on the waters that you're fishing. Uh, so you should have complete belief that you've got the right tactic early on in your day. So if you're looking for those areas, does that mean you may not fish the head of the pool? Or if obviously, I guess it's dictated, isn't it? If you're picking them up in that sort of water, you think, right, that's the place. But do, I'm a sucker for fast water and yeah. I love fishing that 
part of it as well. But will you still fish that or will you decide, okay, I think this is where the fish are going to be today and then look for the next spot that's similar or will you fish the water as it were? Um, it, it sort of goes back to my competitive days where you, you grade water in your head. You have A, B and C class water. And um, so if you imagine on a pool, that could be tail, middle, head. Um, you will, all of those pieces of water will hold fish. But if you know that the head of the pool is your prime area for targeting and you're on a pleasure day, there's no point wasting time. I say wasting time. There's no point spending time on the water that A, you don't enjoy fishing, or B, you don't think offers you much chance. Um, Whereas in a competition, the reason you graded it like that was because you knew that um, some areas, uh, everyone would have the same A-class water. And if it's heavily pressured water, the fish also are going to be harder to catch in your favoured bit. So then you're going to your B-class water, your less favourite, but everybody's less favourite. So the fish should, in theory, be a little bit easier. Never say easy, but at least a little bit easier. Cool, cool. You mentioned about leader there, and something I meant to ask you about as well was tippet. And do you have any thoughts on that? And um, anything you would suggest diameter wise or strength wise? What What are your thoughts there? Sure. Um, like you, I'm very lucky. I fish with a broad range of people. People who are incredibly particular about the tip that they select and I followed in that footsteps a little bit for a short while and um, it wasn't actually until I um, I started guiding uh, one particular client of mine who just wanted to catch tippet class record grayling which it goes completely against anything that I'd ever want to do um, but that's what he enjoys doing and it wasn't until we started catching big grayling on like six, eight pound, ten pound leader that I realized that it doesn't make a huge difference what the leader diameter does. It, it does in some cases, granted, but what the leader did make a difference on was how quickly your flies got down and how they fished. And it meant that. Uh, rather than going to a seven or eight hits where we feel that because it's finer, we've got more chance, um, I'll literally just fish six sets, so about three and a half pounds um, everywhere. And, and that's done me really well. Uh, what it does mean over someone using one, one and a half pound leader is I might have to use a slightly heavier fly to do the same job that they're doing. Um, yeah. But it it doesn't. The fish don't seem to mind as much. I no, it's very interesting you say that. And I know the podcast guest I had, Peter Hayes and Don Stasica, debunked the thin uh, diameter mono, saying that it doesn't make that much difference. And, you know, I've been fishing three, four pound at home and it doesn't seem to make any discernible difference. But I suppose part of it as well, if you want to do it, do it and if it makes you confident and i'm a huge believer in if you fish confidently you're probably going to fish better that, that's probably right isn't uh, that, it? absolutely um i mean confidence by far outweighs fly choice or um anything tackle setup anything if you're confident in what you're doing um you'll you'll have a good day regardless of how many you catch um, the only time I found that leader, uh, that tippet does make a difference was in Bosnia, where the fish, the water is so clear and the fish is see so much. And there wasn't really a way around it. You could go as thin as you liked on tippet and they weren't having it. You actually had to change your approach and fish downstream to them. So they saw no aspect of the leader. Uh, and then you can still fish quite heavy. No, I say heavy, uh, your seven or six sets. Um, but because you're presenting the fly in a different manner, you caught the fish. Yeah. Here's something then, all these great tips that you've given us today, let's say it all happens and you hook a big one. Yes. 
What is your advice for somebody um, if it's a sizable grayling um, playing it and getting it in? Um, oh, lots of advice. Key ones: don't panic, which <laughs> is um, it's so much easier said than done. Um, I mean, I panic, um, so um, I can't really expect anyone not to. Um, don't try and rush them in. Um, obviously, the longer they're in the river, the more chance you've got of losing them. Uh, but similarly, if you try and horse them away from where they want to be, uh, you'll either break them off or pull out of them. They've got quite a soft mouth. Um, so you just have to sort of ride the fight a little bit and stay with them. If they want to go downstream, just follow them. Um, where it's safe to do so, I would always say, keep the line as short as possible and follow the fish, which usually for grayling because of them liking gravel, um, you're usually pretty safe wading for a period of time. Um, and what I've noticed, I don't know if you're the same, but with big grayling, they like to jump. Uh, mm. um, they, seem to, they seem to get to about two pounds and not jump at all. And then over that, they just, they leap and it, and it's, it's not a nice leap either. There's lots of dorsal fin and tail flapping about. Uh, and that can be the time when they, when they come off um, because um, it catches you off guard a little. Um, so yeah, get a big net and, and stay with the fish as close as possible. Yeah. I'd love to say I've had as much experience as you with those huge fish, but, I haven't. <laughs> but it's kind of cool hearing. What about side strain and stuff like that and rod over? Do you take it over to the side to play them? And... Yeah, always try and keep them as upstream as possible. Uh, with that big dorsal fin, as soon as they take the current, they're, they're going down. Um, and the worst thing you can do is try and get them back up. Um, if they want, if they, go over the next run and into the next pool your your best bet is to get out of the river and follow them down and try and land them in the next pool uh side strain is key to not letting them go and uh one really good way but um making sure you're in the right place on the river to do so is to actually put the rod tip underneath the water and use that to steer them um up or to the area that you want um, and that takes away their ability to jump, but also their ability to turn and use the, the faster su surface current to their ability. Yeah, great tips. Yeah. We've covered so much um, here and we've give, you've given me so much and our listeners so much information. Is there anything I've missed that you would like to throw into the mix that, that we haven't covered that you'd like to? Uh, I mean, to be honest with, with grayling it's just about spending time on the water and uh, i think as much as anything keeping expectations reasonable um if if you know you're if you know you're going to a venue with a lot of grayling uh, you've got a good chance of catching a lot of fish if you know you're going to a venue with just a few fish but a chance of a big one don't expect the same amount of fish that you're catching at the previous venue and uh, I suppose just because you're going to a big fish venue doesn't mean the fish you catch is going to be big. Um, but you shouldn't be disappointed with a fish that isn't big either. Um, they've all, Good. yeah, they've all battled the elements and nature to to get to where they are. And any, particularly any grayling, it's a wild creature. It's it's done its hard yards even to grow to three or four inches let alone three or four pounds yeah that's a good point they're all good aren't they they are, they are. yeah yeah that's great well there's been so much here and we've we've been chatting over an hour um about it i'd heard that you are going to be running a grayling masterclass and you've got one coming up so if our listeners want to try and get hold of you and and learn a little bit more do you want to tell us a little bit about it yes yeah so essentially what we've paraphrased into this hour um we'll be looking at, at a couple of grayling master classes one in one in november and one in december uh, that will be on the uh, on the short stream so on the river test system and 
really a chance to look at the methods, the setup, and and actually get on the water with them and trial them out. And it's a, a great chance. It's it's great being able to tell people over the podcast here uh, about the methods, but until you set them up and trial them, um, you can't come back and ask those questions. So uh, these masterclasses and the guided days are a, are a great time to to ask those questions that you um, that you wouldn't ordinarily get answered. And the cool thing is when you're standing next to somebody as well, the subtlest little thing you're going to spot and you can help people. Yeah. You'll see it quickly and help people with that to, to help them improve a little bit, I guess. Uh, absolutely. Um, so um, I spend uh, a fair number of days teaching every year and you do, you pick up those little bits and, and there's also times when um, out of experience you instinctively do something that you don't always think to pass on because it, it just doesn't come to your mind but if someone watches you in that process they they can see it and pick up on it and ask about it that's cool so how can people contact you about that should they want to sign up for it um, so the best way to do it um as i say there's one in november and one in december um if you uh, either drop me an email uh, to alex a-l-e-x at aardvark um, mcleod.com which is double a r d b a r k m c l e o d dot com uh, or uh, call our office and that's o one nine eight o eight four seven three eight nine um then you can uh, join on one of the two days and if the dates don't work uh, as i say one on one and um, sort of small group guided days are available too cool and lastly because you've given me so much information um and really interesting insights into to fishing um you also run a sunday tying video as well uh on youtube where where can people find you on that um yeah so i started a, a live stream time video uh, every fortnightly on a sunday um and that's just on a um if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, which is YouTube um, forward slash Alex Jardine Fly Fishing, uh, and on there you'll find various um, fly tying streams. And essentially, the the idea came about. Uh, I used to do a lot of the Fly Dressers Guild um, tying evenings, and um, with this year they've just not been possible to to run. Um, so. I've taken that style of evening uh, where we look at tying five or six different flies um, and focusing on one topic. And this Sunday, it will actually be top grayling flies for the winter. So pretty <laughs> fun. That was a lucky coincidence. Yeah. I didn't. I genuinely had no idea. So that's really, really cool. Um, Al, we've spoken, as I said, for well over an hour now. You've you've just been really open with some great information i've got some stuff from it and it's been really really interesting last question are you loving it as much as always uh, always yeah and um, i can't fault fishing it's uh, it's a constant that hopefully um hopefully a flame that will never burn out fantastic well i i look forward to seeing pictures of your son on the river at at some stage as well so very much look forward to that i hope we can catch up soon and do some fishing i'd love to get you back down on the tour again and and i know we've thrown for salmon down there as well in the past and it would be great to do that again as well so i'd like to thank you for being a great um guest that's packed so much information into an hour and a quarter so uh, alex jardine thank you so much for being a guest on the fly culture podcast Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pete, and uh, see you on the river soon. Thanks very much indeed. Everybody, this has been the Fly Culture Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. As ever, there are lots more podcasts planned, so keep tuned and I hope you keep enjoying them. Thanks very much for listening.